Section 16 of Hard Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Section 16, Chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 11 Lower and Lower The figure descended the great stairs, steadily, steadily, always verging like a weight in deep water to the black gulf at the bottom. Mr. Gradgrind, apprised of his wife's decease, made an expedition from London and buried her in a business-like manner. He then returned with promptitude to the national cinder-heap, and resumed his sifting for the odds and ends he wanted, and his throwing of the dust about into the eyes of other people who wanted other odds and ends. In fact, resumed his parliamentary duties. In the meantime, Mrs. Sparsit kept unwinking watch and ward, separated from her staircase all the week by the length of iron road dividing Coke Town from the country house, she yet maintained her cat-like observation of Louisa, through her husband, through her brother, through James Harthouse, through the outsides of letters and packets, through everything animate and inanimate that at any time went near the stairs. "'Your foot on the last step, my lady,' said Mrs. Sparsit, apostrophizing the descending figure with the aid of her threatening mitten, "'and all your art shall never blind me.' Art or nature, though— the original stock of Louisa's character, or the graft of circumstances upon it, her curious reserve did baffle, while it stimulated one as sagacious as Mrs. Sparsit. There were times when Mr. James Harthouse was not sure of her. There were times when he could not read the face he had studied so long, and when this lonely girl was a greater mystery to him than any woman of the world with a ring of satellites to help her. So the time went on until it happened that Mr. Bounderby was called away from home by business which required his presence elsewhere for three or four days. It was on a Friday that he intimated this to Mrs. Sparsit at the bank, adding, "'But you'll go down to-morrow, ma'am, all the same. You'll go down just as if I was there. It will make no difference to you.' "'Pray, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsit reproachfully, "'let me beg you not to say that.' "'Your absence will make a vast difference to me, sir, as I think you very well know.' "'Well, ma'am, then you must get on in my absence as well as you can,' said Mr. Bounderby, not displeased. "'Mr. Bounderby,' retorted Mrs. Sparsit, "'your will is to me a law, sir. Otherwise it might be my inclination to dispute your kind commands, not feeling sure that it will be quite so agreeable to Miss Gradgrind to receive me, as it ever is to your own munificent hospitality. But you shall say no more, sir. I will go upon your invitation. "'Why, when I invite you to my house, ma'am,' said Bounderby, opening his eyes, "'I should hope you want no other invitation.' "'No, indeed, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsit. "'I should hope not. Say no more, sir. I would, sir, I could see you gay again.' "'What do you mean, ma'am?' blustered Bounderby. "'Sir,' rejoined Mrs. Sparsit, "'there was wont to be an elasticity in you which I sadly miss. "'Be buoyant, sir.' "'Mr. Bounderby, under the influence of this difficult adjuration, "'backed up by her compassionate eye, "'could only scratch his head in a feeble and ridiculous manner, "'and afterwards assert himself at a distance "'by being heard to bully the small fry of business all the morning.' "'Bitzer,' said Mrs. Sparsit that afternoon, when her patron was gone on his journey, and the bank was closing, "'present my compliments to young Mr. Thomas, and ask him if he would step up and partake of a lamb-chop and walnut ketchup, with a glass of India ale. Young Mr. Thomas, being usually ready for anything in that way, returned a gracious answer, and followed on its heels. "'Mr. Thomas,' said Mrs. Sparsit, "'these plain viands being on table, I thought you might be tempted.' "'Thank ye, Mrs. Sparsit,' said the whelp, and gloomily fell to. "'How is Mr. Harthouse, Mr. Tom?' asked Mrs. Sparsit. "'Oh, he's all right,' said Tom. "'Where may he be at present? 
Mrs. Sparsit asked, in a light, conversational manner, after mentally devoting the whelp to the Furies for being so uncommunicative. "'He is shooting in Yorkshire,' said Tom. "'Sent Lou a basket half as big as a church yesterday.' "'The kind of gentleman now,' said Mrs. Sparsit sweetly, "'whom one might wager to be a good shot.' "'Crack,' said Tom. He had long been a down-looking young fellow, but this characteristic had so increased of late that he never raised his eyes to any face for three seconds together. Mrs. Sparsett consequently had ample means of watching his looks, if she were so inclined. "'Mr. Harthouse is a great favourite of mine,' said Mrs. Sparsett, as indeed he is of most people. May we expect to see him again shortly, Mr. Tom?' "'Why, I expect to see him to-morrow,' returned the whelp. "'Good news!' cried Mrs. Sparsett blandly. "'I have got an appointment with him to meet him in the evening at the station here,' said Tom, "'and I am going to dine with him afterwards, I believe. "'He is not coming down to the country house for a week or so, being due somewhere else. "'At least he says so. "'But I shouldn't wonder if he was to stop here over Sunday and stray that way.' "'Which reminds me,' said Mrs. Sparsett, "'would you remember a message to your sister, Mr. Tom, "'if I was to charge you with one?' "'Well, I'll try,' returned the reluctant whelp, "'if it isn't a long un. "'It is merely my respectful compliments,' said Mrs. Sparsett, "'and I fear I may not trouble her with my society this week, "'being still a little nervous, "'and better, perhaps, by my poor self.' "'Oh, if that's all,' observed Tom, "'It wouldn't much matter, even if I was to forget it, "'for Lou's not likely to think of you unless she sees you.' "'Having paid for his entertainment with this agreeable compliment, "'he relapsed into a hang-dog silence "'until there was no more India ale left, "'when he said, "'Well, Mrs. Sparsett, I must be off,' and went off. "'Next day, Saturday, Mrs. Sparsett sat at her window all day long, "'looking at the customers coming in and out, watching the postman, keeping an eye on the general traffic of the street, revolving many things in her mind, but above all keeping her attention on her staircase. The evening come, she put on her bonnet and shawl and went quietly out, having her reasons for hovering in a furtive way about the station by which a passenger would arrive from Yorkshire, and for preferring to peep into it round pillars and corners and out of ladies' waiting-room windows, to appearing in its precincts openly. Tom was in attendance, and loitered about until the expected train came in. It brought no Mr. Harthouse. Tom waited until the crowd had dispersed and the bustle was over, and then referred to a posted list of trains, and took counsel with porters. That done, he strolled away idly, stopping in the street, and looking up it and down it, and lifting his hat off and putting it on again, and yawning and stretching himself, and exhibiting all the symptoms of mortal weariness to be expected in one who had still to wait until the next train should come in, an hour and forty minutes hence. "'This is a device to keep him out of the way,' said Mrs. Sparsett, starting from the dull office window whence she had watched him last. "'Harthouse is with his sister now.' It was the conception of an inspired moment, and she shot off with her utmost swiftness to work it out. The station for the country house was at the opposite end of the town. The time was short, the road not easy, but she was so quick in pouncing on a disengaged coach, so quick in darting out of it, producing her money, seizing her ticket, and diving into the train, that she was borne along the arches, spanning the land of coal pits past and present, as if she had been caught up in a cloud and whirled away. All the journey, immovable in the air, though never left behind, plain to the dark eyes of her mind as the electric wires which ruled a colossal strip of music-paper out of the evening sky, were plain to the dark eyes of her body. Mrs. Sparsett saw her staircase with the figure coming down, very near the bottom now, upon the brink of the abyss. An overcast September evening, just at nightfall, saw beneath its drooping eyelids Mrs. Sparsett glide out of her carriage, pass down the wooden steps of the little station into a stony road, cross it into a green lane, and become hidden in a summer growth of leaves and branches. 
one or two late birds sleepily chirping in their nests, and a bat heavily crossing and recrossing her, and the reek of her own tread in the thick dust that felt like velvet, were all Mrs. Sparsit heard or saw, until she very softly closed the gate. She went up to the house, keeping within the shrubbery, and went round it, peeping between the leaves at the lower windows. Most of them were open, as they usually were in such warm weather, but there were no lights yet, and all was silent. She tried the garden with no better effect. She thought of the wood and stole towards it, heedless of long grass and briars, of worms, snails, and slugs, and all the creeping things that be. With her dark eyes and her hooked nose warily in advance of her, Mrs. Sparsit softly crushed her way through the thick undergrowth, so intent upon her object that she probably would have done no less if the wood had been a wood of adders. Hark! The smaller birds might have tumbled out of their nests, fascinated by the glittering of Mrs. Sparsit's eyes in the gloom, as she stopped and listened. Low voices close at hand, his voice and hers. The appointment was a device to keep the brother away. There they were yonder by the felled tree. Bending low among the dewy grass, Mrs. Sparsit advanced closer to them. She drew herself up, and stood behind a tree, like Robinson Crusoe, in his ambuscade against the savages. So near to them, that, at a spring, and that no great one, she could have touched them both. He was there secretly, and had not shown himself at the house. He had come on horseback, and must have passed through the neighbouring fields, for his horse was tied to the meadow-side of the fence within a few paces. "'My dearest love,' said he, "'what could I do? Knowing you were alone, was it possible that I could stay away?' "'You may hang your head to make yourself more attractive. I don't know what they see in you when you hold it up,' thought Mrs. Sparsit. "'But you little think, my dearest love, whose eyes are on you.' That she hung her head was certain— she urged him to go away, she commanded him to go away, but she neither turned her face to him nor raised it. Yet it was remarkable that she sat as still as ever the amiable woman in ambuscade had seen her sit at any period in her life. Her hands rested in one another, like the hands of a statue, and even her manner of speaking was not hurried. "'My dear child,' said Harthouse, Mrs. Sparsit saw with delight that his arm embraced her. "'Will you not bear with my society for a little while?' "'Not here.' "'Where, Louisa?' "'Not here.' "'But we have so little time to make so much of, and I have come so far, and am altogether so devoted and distracted. There never was a slave at once so devoted and ill-used by his mistress. To look for your sunny welcome that has warmed me into life— and to be received in your frozen manner is a heart-rending. Am I to say again that I must be left to myself here? But we must meet, my dear Louisa. Where shall we meet? They both started. The listener started guiltily, too, for she thought there was another listener among the trees. It was only rain, beginning to fall fast in heavy drops. Shall I ride up to the house a few minutes hence? "'innocently supposing that its master is at home "'and will be charmed to receive me? "'No! "'Your cruel commands are implicitly to be obeyed, "'though I am the most unfortunate fellow in the world, I believe, "'to have been insensible to all other women, "'and to have fallen prostrate at last "'under the foot of the most beautiful "'and the most engaging and the most imperious. "'My dearest Louisa, I cannot go myself "'or let you go in this hard abuse of your power.' Mrs. Sparsit saw him detain her with his encircling arm, and heard him, then and there, within her, Mrs. Sparsit's greedy hearing, tell her how he loved her, and how she was the stake for which he ardently desired to play away all that he had in life. The objects he had lately pursued turned worthless beside her. Such success as was almost in his grasp, he flung away from him like the dirt it was, compared with her. Its pursuit, nevertheless, if it kept him near her, or its renunciation if it took him from her, or flight if she shared it, or secrecy if she commanded it, or any fate or every fate, all was alike to him, so that she was true to him. 
the man who had seen how cast away she was, whom she had inspired at their first meeting with an admiration, an interest of which he had thought himself incapable, whom she had received into her confidence, who was devoted to her and adored her. All this and more, in his hurry, and in hers, in the whirl of her own gratified malice, in the dread of being discovered, in the rapidly increasing noise of heavy rain among the leaves, and a thunderstorm rolling up, Mrs. Sparsit received into her mind, set off with such an unavoidable halo of confusion and indistinctness, that when at length he climbed the fence and led his horse away, she was not sure where they were to meet, or when, except that they had said it was to be that night. But one of them yet remained in the darkness before her, and while she tracked that one she must be right. "'Oh, my dearest love,' thought Mrs. Sparsit, "'you little think how well attended you are.' Mrs. Sparsit saw her out of the wood, and saw her enter the house. What to do next? It rained now in a sheet of water. Mrs. Sparsit's white stockings were of many colours, green predominating. Prickly things were in her shoes. Caterpillars slung themselves in hammocks of their own making from various parts of her dress. Rills ran from her bonnet and her Roman nose. In such condition Mrs. Sparsit stood hidden in the density of the shrubbery, considering what next. Lo! Louisa coming out of the house, hastily cloaked and muffled and stealing away. She elopes. She falls from the lowermost stair and is swallowed up in the gulf. Indifferent to the rain and moving with a quick determined step, she struck into a side path parallel with the ride. Mrs. Sparsit followed in the shadow of the trees at but a short distance, for it was not easy to keep a figure in view going quickly through the umbrageous darkness. When she stopped to close the side gate without noise, Mrs. Sparsit stopped. When she went on, Mrs. Sparsit went on. She went by the way Mrs. Sparsit had come, emerged from the green lane, crossed the stony road, and ascended the wooden steps to the railroad. A train for Coketown would come through presently, Mrs. Sparsit knew, so she understood Coketown to be her first place of destination. In Mrs. Sparsit's limp and streaming state, no extensive precautions were necessary to change her usual appearance, but she stopped under the lee of the station wall, tumbled her shawl into a new shape, and put it on over her bonnet. So disguised, she had no fear of being recognized when she followed up the railroad steps and paid her money in the small office. Louisa sat waiting in a corner. Mrs. Sparsit sat waiting in another corner. Both listened to the thunder, which was loud, and to the rain as it washed off the roof and pattered on the parapets of the arches. Two or three lamps were rained out and blown out, so... Both saw the lightning to advantage as it quivered and zigzagged on the iron tracks. The seizure of the station, with a fit of trembling, gradually deepening to a complaint of the heart, announced the train. Fire and steam and smoke and red light, a hiss, a crash, a bell, and a shriek. Louisa put into one carriage, Mrs. Sparsit put into another, the little station a desert speck in the thunderstorm. Though her teeth chattered in her head from wet and cold, Mrs. Sparsit exulted hugely. The figure had plunged down the precipice, and she felt herself, as it were, attending on the body. Could she, who had been so active in the getting up of the funeral triumph, do less than exult? She will be at Coketown long before him, thought Mrs. Sparsit, though his horse is never so good. Where will she wait for him, and where will they go together? Patience, we shall see. The tremendous rain occasioned infinite confusion when the train stopped at its destination. Gutters and pipes had burst, drains had overflowed, and streets were under water. In the first instant of alighting, Mrs. Sparsit turned her distracted eyes towards the waiting coaches, which were in great request. She will get into one, she considered, and will be away before I can follow in another. At all risks of being run over, I must see the number and hear the order given to the coachman. But Mrs. Sparsit was wrong in her calculation. Louisa got into no coach and was already gone. 
The black eyes kept upon the railroad carriage in which she had travelled settled upon it a moment too late. The door not being opened after several minutes, Mrs. Sparsit passed it and repassed it, saw nothing, looked in and found it empty. Wet through and through, with her feet squelching and squashing in her shoes whenever she moved, with a rash of rain upon her classical visage, with a bonnet like an overripe fig, with all her clothes spoiled, with damp impressions of every button, string, and hook and eye she wore, printed off upon her highly connected back, with a stagnant verdure on her general exterior, such as accumulates on an old park fence in a mouldy lane. Mrs. Sparsit had no resource but to burst into tears of bitterness and say, "'I have lost her.'" Chapter Twelve, Down. The National Dustmen, after entertaining one another with a great many noisy little fights among themselves, had dispersed for the present, and Mr. Gradgrind was at home for the vacation. He sat writing in the room with a deadly statistical clock, proving something, no doubt, probably in the main, that the Good Samaritan was a bad economist. The noise of the rain did not disturb him much, but it attracted his attention sufficiently to make him raise his head sometimes, as if he were rather remonstrating with the elements. When it thundered very loudly, he glanced towards Coketown, having it in his mind that some of the tall chimneys might be struck by lightning. The thunder was rolling into distance, and the rain was pouring down like a deluge, when the door of his room opened. He looked round the lamp upon his table, and saw with amazement his eldest daughter. "'Louisa! Father, I want to speak to you.' "'What is the matter? How strange you look! And good heaven!' said Mr. Gradgrind, wondering more and more. "'Have you come here exposed to this storm?' She put her hands to her dress, as if she hardly knew. Yes. Then she uncovered her head, and letting her cloak and hood fall where they might, stood looking at him, so colourless, so dishevelled, so defiant and despairing that he was afraid of her. What is it? I conjure you, Louisa, tell me what is the matter. She dropped into a chair before him, and put her cold hand on his arm. Father, you have trained me from my cradle? Yes, Louisa. I curse the hour in which I was born to such a destiny. He looked at her in doubt and dread, vacantly repeating, Curse the hour! Curse the hour! How could you give me life, and take from me all the inappreciable things that raise it from the state of conscious death? Where are the graces of my soul? Where are the sentiments of my heart? What have you done, O oh Father, what have you done with the garden that should have bloomed once in this great wilderness here? She struck herself with both her hands upon her bosom. If it had ever been here, its ashes alone would save me from the void in which my whole life sinks. I did not mean to say this, but, Father, you remember the last time we conversed in this room? He had been so wholly unprepared for what he heard now, that it was with difficulty he answered. Yes, Louisa. What has risen to my lips now would have risen to my lips then, if you had given me a moment's help. I don't reproach you, Father. What you have never nurtured in me, you have never nurtured in yourself. But, oh, if you had only done so long ago, or if you had only neglected me, what a much better and much happier creature I should have been this day! On hearing this, after all his care, he bowed his head upon his hand and groaned aloud. Father, if you had known, when we were last together here, what even I feared while I strove against it, as it has been my task from infancy to strive against every natural prompting that has arisen in my heart, if you had known that there lingered in my breast sensibilities, affections, weaknesses capable of being cherished into strength, defying all the calculations ever made by man, and no more known to his arithmetic than his Creator is, would you have given me to the husband whom I am now sure that I hate? He said, No, no, my poor child. Would you have doomed me at any time to the frost and blight that have hardened and spoiled me? Would you have robbed me for no one's enrichment, only for the greater desolation of this world, of the immaterial part of my life, the spring and summer of my belief, 
my refuge from what is sordid and bad in the real things around me, my school in which I should have learned to be more humble and more trusting with them, and to hope in my little sphere to make them better? Oh, no, 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 Louisa! Yet, father, if I had been stone blind, if I had groped my way by my sense of touch, and had been free, while I knew the shapes and surfaces of things, to exercise my fancy somewhat in regard to them, I should have been a million times wiser, happier, more loving, more contented, more innocent and human in all good respects than I am with the eyes I have. Now hear what I have come to say. He moved to support her with his arm. She, rising as he did so, they stood close together, she with a hand upon his shoulder looking fixedly in his face. With a hunger and thirst upon me, father, which have never been for a moment appeased, with an ardent impulse towards some region where rules and figures and definitions were not quite absolute, I have grown up battling every inch of my way. I never knew you were unhappy, my child. Father, I always knew it. In this strife I have almost repulsed and crushed my better angel into a demon. What I have learned has left me doubting, misbelieving, despising, regretting what I have not learned, and my dismal resource has been to think that life would soon go by, and that nothing in it could be worth the pain and trouble of a contest. "'And you so young, Louisa,' he said with pity. "'And I so young. In this condition, father, for I show you now, without fear or favour, the ordinary deadened state of my mind as I know it. You proposed my husband to me. I took him. I never made a pretense to him or you that I loved him. I knew, and father you knew, and he knew, that I never did. I was not wholly indifferent, for I had a hope of being pleasant and useful to Tom. I made that wild escape into something visionary, and have slowly found out how wild it was. But Tom had been the subject of all the little tenderness of my life. Perhaps he became so, because I knew so well how to pity him. It matters little now, except as it may dispose you to think more leniently of his errors. As her father held her in his arms, she put her other hand upon his other shoulder, and still looking fixedly in his face, went on. When I was irrevocably married, there rose up into rebellion against the tie, the old strife, made fiercer by all those causes of disparity which arise out of our two individual natures, and which no general laws shall ever rule or state for me, father, until they shall be able to direct the anatomist where to strike his knife into the secrets of my soul. Louisa, he said, and said imploringly, for he well remembered what had passed between them in their former interview. I do not reproach you, father. I make no complaint. I am here with another object. What can I do, child? Ask me what you will. I am coming to it. Father, chance then threw into my way a new acquaintance, a man such as I had had no experience of, used to the world, light, polished, easy, making no pretenses, avowing the low estimate of everything, that I was half afraid to form in secret, conveying to me almost immediately, though I don't know how or by what degrees, that he understood me and read my thoughts. I could not find that he was worse than I. There seemed to be a near affinity between us. I only wondered it should be worth his while, who cared for nothing else, to care so much for me. For you, Louisa. Her father might instinctively have loosened his hold, but that he felt her strength departing from her, and saw a wild, dilating fire in the eyes steadfastly regarding him. I say nothing of his plea for claiming my confidence. It matters very little how he gained it. Father, he did gain it. What you know of the story of my marriage he soon knew, just as well. Her father's face was ashy white, and he held her in both his arms. I have done no worse, I have not disgraced you, but if you ask me whether I have loved him or do love him, I tell you plainly, father, that it may be so. I don't know. She took her hands suddenly from his shoulders and pressed them both upon her side, while in her face, not like itself, and in her figure, drawn up, resolute to finish by a last effort what she had to say, the feelings long suppressed broke loose. 
This night, my husband being away, he has been with me, declaring himself my lover. This minute he expects me, for I could release myself of his presence by no other means. I do not know that I am sorry. I do not know that I am ashamed. I do not know that I am degraded in my own esteem. All that I know is your philosophy and your teaching will not save me. Now, Father, you have brought me to this. Save me by some other means. He tightened his hold in time to prevent her sinking on the floor, but she cried out in a terrible voice, I shall die if you hold me. Let me fall upon the ground. And he laid her down there, and saw the pride of his heart and the triumph of his system lying, an insensible heap at his feet. End of chapter 12 End of the second book End of section 16